All right, thanks. Let's get started. So as Jeanette said, I'm Connor Power. I'm a systems development engineer in the worldwide consumer group for within the information security group within the worldwide consumer business of Amazon. Um, we're responsible for everything from fulfillment centers to drones. So we have a fairly broad scope. We're also a small business. You may have heard of us, I hope. So what do I actually do? I lead up our network visibility program. The fancy way of describing that is I take requirements from our internal customers and translate them into solutions we deploy in our network. What that actually means is they tell me what they want to see and I go make it happen. So just for a quick disclaimer here, while I'm happy to take questions about the material we discuss in this presentation, there are certain details I can't go into, such as the scale of our deployment or what we may or may not see in the logs. I'll also warn you, I have no pyramids, triangles, or hand-drawn diagrams. <laughs> but if you'd actually like to know more about these kind of problems we're working on, I actually am hiring. That's the only plug I'll do. OK, so we're going to talk about how we use Bro on our corporate network. And that's the big reveal today. Amazon does use Bro in part of the solution on its corporate network. We're going to talk about why we even do this in the first place, what our existing vendor solution looked like, why we decided to build our own solution, why we chose Bro as part of that decision, some of the challenges we faced during our deployment, and ultimately the lessons we've learned as well. So I'm sure some of you have read or heard about how Amazon.com's website is built around service oriented architecture. It also applies to our infrastructure as well. There is no single infrastructure team which looks after it all. There are smaller teams who look after individual components and continue to scale and grow to support the business. What we need to do is make sure we keep pace, pace with the growth that the growth of this network. So why would we even do this? We want to understand what's normal on our corporate network, and more importantly, what's not normal, and will require further investigation. We can also use the data we collect to feed into any um, compliance or regulatory schemes that we may be subject to. And I'd like to point out, Bro is not the only thing we do. I could talk about the other things, but I don't think it's appropriate for Brocon. So how did it all look in the start? Network instrumentation is a true view of what's happening on the wire. This means we don't have to entirely rely on client-side instrumentation. There also may be places or systems you can't actually deploy these solutions to in the first place. I'm not saying that it's bad, but just for why we're, the way we were looking at it is network visibility gave us a true understanding. What, hap what really means is the network is the common denominator here. And when I say network sensors, what do I actually mean by that? I'm talking about any appliance or application, software, whatever it may be, that takes data to a span port, an optical tap, anything along those lines, and gives you a summarized output. This can be intrusion detection style alerts, such as host X has connected to network Y, or full-blown deep packet inspection, which you get from Bro. So we've said network sensors will achieve the required goal. And those are pretty simple to buy, right? So that's exactly what we did. We bought some sensors, plugged them into our network, Voila, goal achieved, we now have visibility. So thanks, no, it's not where it stops. So this was the 10,000 foot view of our existing vendor solution. And back then, life was a lot simpler. Our network firewalls only had one gigabit second interfaces. So there was an upper bound on the amount of traffic we actually had to process. We had span sessions configured on our routers. Anything destined towards our firewall, we mirrored to our network sensor. We also had a small number of firewalls as well, so less firewalls to monitors, less work. And with this vendor solution, we were able to see the source, destination, ports, and protocols uh, that was used in our network. It looked a bit like NetFlow data. And why don't we just entirely rely on NetFlow data? We didn't want to rely on sample data. With this network sensor, we got true view of what was happening on the wire. And our edge firewall design may have looked something like this. You can see here we have the vendor appliance on the inside leg of the firewall. We do this because on our corporate network, we obviously don't assign public IP addresses to every internal device. It'd be a waste of IP space. So that means we have to do address translation of outbound traffic. And by putting the vendor appliance on the inside leg, we see the true source and destination of all traffic leaving our network. Also with this vendor solution, there's a central management console that manages all these individual sensors which allows authorized users to search or query for data. We also have NetFlow being exported from our firewalls as well. We do this because with our choice of network, or rather firewall vendor, they export NetFlow data for policy denies as well. So we get another kind of a source of information on what's going on in our network. 
Uh, and why do we do NetFlow and our network sensor? It gives us a level of redundancy. In the event of a failure or misconfiguration of one of them, we still have some insight to what's actually happening. And then I mentioned spam ports in that diagram. What does that actually mean? So we consider spam ports to be one of the two primary ways we can collect data from our network. The other one being optical taps or network taps. I've taken this diagram from the Cisco website. But what the spam port allows you to do is to basically take a copy of traffic um, on one interface or VLAN and mirror it out to another port. This way, your solution doesn't have to be physically in line of what the, tra the traffic you're trying to capture. So we have a solution at this point. Why would we do anything different? The traffic volumes on our network were increasing, and they were getting close to hitting one gigabit a second. We had an upgrade path available for our firewall vendor, but our network sensor at the time didn't have one available. There was no, we were stuck at one gig at the time. To top it off, the platform we're using, they also decided to end of life. So it's not a great position to be in. We were getting a lot better about how we actually use this data. There was a definitely an increase in internal maturity. Unfortunately, that led to other issues. We started hitting scaling limits in the vendor management platform. We had gone from users running ad hoc queries against the vendor's API to fully automated solutions. We started stressing this box a lot. We also discovered with the vendor management box, it could only control so many sensors at one time. Does this mean we now have to offer multiple APIs to get a consistent view of what's going on in our network? So how can we ensure our future network centers continue to keep pace with the growth of our network? We've come close to hitting vendor limits on our existing solution in both terms of traffic volumes and the number of sensors. Do we actually need all the features we're using today? If we can reduce the number of features in our vendor appliance, can we get squeeze more performance out of an individual sensor? Or even better, can we reduce the likelihood of actually running into any weird, obscure bug? Maybe there is another way. Instead of just buying the next generation vendor solution, maybe we consider building it ourselves. So here are some of the things we thought about when coming up with the build versus buy decision. This chart look, may, may look very different for your organization. So when we talk about speed of execution, those vendor appliances look expensive when you look at the, the cost. But when you factor in your time, plus the opportunity cost of the things you're not working on, maybe they'll look a lot cheaper in the end. There's also control. If you build, you have access to the source code. But do you have the developers who can extend the features you need or patch any bugs you may run into? An example of where we had control issues with our existing vendor platform was, I've said we've had this central management box. All the data went there. It was stored on a hard disk on the box. The disk filled up, so we started having to delete historical data. That's not a great place to be in. Maybe we could have had, if we had control, we could have archived it to somewhere like AWS's S3. There's vendor support. For those of you who buy appliances or software, they may offer some additional support as well. Like, when you build your own solution, you're now on the hook for supporting this. Do you offer the same guarantees that your vendor supplies? Can you do four-hour hardware replacements? When the solution breaks, you get to keep both pieces. And then logistics. For, this is probably more applicable for people who deploy into multiple countries, but for every country you operate in, are you aware of all the customs and import regulations in each of those regions? We've had vendor boxes sitting at co country borders for months at a time for various paperwork reasons. And I'm not looking at anyone in particular. We found getting x86 hosts into countries is typically easier. Typically is not always always. We do run into logistics problems every now and again, but the amount of them has decreased. And performance. We kept hearing about other companies who are getting high performance at a low cost. This is what drove us in the end to build our own solution. So when we talk about performance and cost, I want to introduce a concept of what we call cost per gigabit. It's what we use in our basic performance cost trade-off analysis. It's very simple to calculate. You take the cost of the solution, you divide it by the amount of bandwidth it can handle, and now you have cost per gigabit. Obviously, you adjust the metrics as appropriate. We would try to look at these um, cost per gigabit decreases over time to prove we're trending in the right direction. Either way, we're not advocating one way or another. It's up to each company, but there are indirect costs that you need to be aware of either way. So our existing solution, it only looked at layer three and layer four information. Is this what we want in our next generation solution? My coworkers evaluated a few options. Firstly, they started looking at end probe. 
The reason we looked at mProbe, it gave us feature parity what, what our vendor was offering us today. But when we looked at the box we were running it on, there was a lot of CPU spare unused. We started turning on plugins and all the other stuff in mProbe offered. There was still capacity to spare, and even then, we weren't entirely satisfied with the level of output we were getting. So then we moved on to Snort and Suricata. And I'll cover both of these at the same time. What we found is there was significant upfront investment required in tuning signatures and doing all that stuff to extract value from these two applications. Then we moved on to Bro. When we came to Bro, we quickly decided that was a solution for us. We were getting deep packet level visibility into what was happening on our network written into plain text files. There was a huge amount of possibilities about what we could do with this data. We started off by default by using a tab separated value format. We learned that it wasn't great for us, and I'll tell you why later. And more importantly, Bro was offering us an unbiased view of what was happening in our network. It wasn't trying to interpret what was good or bad. It was simply telling us this is what was happening. We can make up our own minds on what's good or bad. So now, we've decided on using Bro as our replacement solution. So in our generation one design, it ran on a generic x86 host. It was directly cabled to our routers, which was connected to our firewall. So all we did was have to update our span configuration to send traffic to the bro host instead of the network sensor. From a hardware perspective, there was nothing particularly custom or unique about this setup. And it looked like this. You'll see this diagram looks pretty similar to our existing vendor solution. We've swapped out the vendor network sensor for a host running bro. But appearances can be deceiving. We now have complete control over what's running on the bro host, the features we turn on, and so on. There's a lot of flexibility. This was a great win for us. Having said that, without the central vendor management appliance, we now have to run log tailing agents on our bro hosts, which stream data to our central log store. So while we've moved on to a bro-based solution with our generation one design, there were still a couple of challenges we folk fake we faced, rather, sorry. Our bro host was a single point of failure. It's why we chose to run NetFlow at the same time. It offers a level of redundancy. But our security teams don't like when they lose the depth of visibility that bro offers. There was still significant installed and logistics pain. Amazon data centers are not optimized around individual hosts showing up. Multiple data centers, as we were deploying the solution, were feeling this pain. We also were, had increased traffic volumes in our network. Unfortunately, this triggered a bug in our routers with the span sessions. It caused them to reload. This made our networking team quite unhappy. We did have to work with our vendor to come up with a workaround, and we did come up with one, but uh, there's a lot of trust issues now on basically is spans the right solution for us over the long term. And the network is always growing. We have to keep pace with the scale of the growth. Remaining, sorry, we have to keep pace with the scope. We have to keep pace with this growth. And we have to basically have cheap and incremental scaling units for this solution as well. Otherwise, it gets very expensive. And remaining static is an option as well. The network is never going to stop growing. So this is how we ranked our solution after we finished the deployment of generation one. Single point of failure. We were running a single host. We had NetFlow as a backup. But again, the depth of visibility was an issue. So there's definitely room for improvement here. In terms of data collection, we were still using span sessions, but we've stopped the reloads. So we're heading in the right direction, at least. And control. This is where we've made serious progress. We're no longer tied to a vendor's roadmap or their historical choices. We can choose the features and capabilities we need. And scalability. Our lab testing shows that our host will fall over when we reach a certain bandwidth point. What do we do at that point? Just buy a bigger host? Or how do you split a span port across multiple hosts anyway? The logistics and install effort. Shipping has gotten a lot easier, but the install effort on the install pain rather still exists in those data centers. And cost per gigabit. Our generic server solution is a lot cheaper than the vendor solution. So we have another win here. So our scorecard looks good, right? We're done, aren't we? Yeah, maybe not so much. So then Seth paid us a visit. And Seth had this remarkable ability of, by just looking at our logs, he could tell us all the ways we were doing it wrong. <laughs> so we started off with this. When we first started out using Bro, we weren't sure what was normal and what wasn't normal. It wasn't obvious to us at the time. 
just because we were generating logs doesn't mean everything was actually healthy and okay. For this particular issue with the history field, it was due to Nick offload settings. We turned off the offload settings on our card, everything went back to health, back to normal. Then we also found that we needed more memory as well. Unfortunately, this isn't a quick process for us. We first have to start off by finding compatible RAM, a vendor who's willing to sell it to us in a low enough quantity, get purchase orders raised, and so on and so on. It's not a fun or easy process. And what's worse is everything we've just finished doing in generation one, we now, go, we now have to go back and redo and install RAM upgrades on these servers. More operational overhead for us. So we use the bro capture loss logs to measure our performance. And we try to keep the capture loss across all the workers on an individual host to be under 1% across all the workers. However, the network continues to scale. And we have to keep pace with this growth if we want to keep our capture loss rates at 1% or under. So in scaling to infinity and beyond, we introduced our generation 1.5 design. We're now using optical taps. We had a lot of fun trying to install these the first time around. It turns out you can install them backwards, and that's why you get minus 40 dBm on a light meter. <laughs> Having said that, now we're using optical taps. Span bugs are no longer a risk. We're not going to trigger any more of them. We also have the benefit of our solution is now completely passive. You can't remove our monitoring solution without recabling the data center. The lesson we learned here is we should have started off with optical taps from the start, but span ports allowed us to get out the door quickly with generation one. We then also introduced a load balancer to split traffic among physical hosts. We're no longer as concerned about squeezing performance from an individual host. LBNL has done similar work. If you haven't read their 100 gig intrusion detection paper, which I believe has already got at least one mention today, you should definitely give it a read. The one thing that you'll note is the load balancer itself is a single point of failure. However, within our deployment, it's a solid state device. The failure rate has been a lot lower. To date, we've only seen one fail in our environment so far. And this was a conscious design decision on our choice. We went in knowingly that this was a failure mode. The reason we were OK with this is we both had NetFlow as a backup, but we also have the ability to change routing on our network. We can then shift traffic to another firewall. So we still have visibility at another firewall while we're doing hardware replacements at the first one. Uh, if you can't read the link, uh, they, these slides will be online later. So. so now with our load balancer, we can horizontally scale traffic across a number of physical hosts. While we do run Bro in a clustered mode, it's limited to a single physical machine. We, our Bro hosts don't know about each other. We do this because we don't want to share state across hosts. We've had one too many bad experiences with state sharing causing strange failure modes. This is not a Bro-specific complaint. This is just a hard problem in general. If we went to a clustered mode across physical or multiple machines, the manager process now becomes a single point of failure. It's not appealing to introduce more failure modes after we've just spent effort trying to eliminate others. But in our configuration, our configuration is very simple. The configuration we deploy to every host is identical. There is no configuration, there's no concept of a manager, a proxy, a worker. It's a nice simplicity win for us. We no longer have to worry about keeping SSH keys or anything else in sync. And here's how it all looks. Our network design hasn't changed all that much. We still have firewalls, routers, and NetFlow being exported from our firewall. We now have introduced optical taps, which connect between our router and firewall, which connect to our load balancer, which then in turn connect to our bro hosts and fan the traffic out. We aren't using spans anymore at this point. So we have the optical tap plugged into our load balancer. Uh, sorry, the question was how do we read the traffic? So our load balancer is built with in-house proprietary technology, which I can't go into too much detail about. But it basically does a form of um, symmetric hashing. So both sides of the connection <laughs> end up on a single host. Okay. This is why we don't have to share state. So the question is, we split the number of connections. Again, I can't go into too much detail, but both sides of connection end up on a single host, and it will basically scale out to a point. Yeah.
So the question was based around, this looks like um, someone else's corporate network. This is entirely focused around our corporate network. So it's not related. To no. So there are other controls in place, but I can't talk about any of those things. So, so now that we have that, here's the progress we've made towards our goals. Single point of failure. The bro host isn't a single point of failure anymore. So there's a good improvement here. Data collection. We've migrated away from span sessions. No more risk of tr triggering bugs, which cause devices to reload. Another win here. In control, we still have the same level of control that was offered to us in our generation one design. So that's still fine. And scalability. While we'll continue to scale to infinity, and we're quite not there yet, we can now add more bro hosts and scale out. So we have another win to deal with this increased growth of the network. However, logistics and install efforts, we've actually gone worse here. We now have multiple individual hosts to install in our data center, in addition to cabling optical taps and getting our load balancer installed. So it's a step backwards in some steps. And cost per gigabit. The costs we've now introduced with our optical taps or load balancer haven't made an overall significant difference to our cost per gigabit. So we're still heading on the right direction there. And we talk about optical taps. This really tests my ability to design diagrams in Visio. <laughs> so when we say optical taps, what does that actually mean? These are entirely passive devices which are splitting off a percentage of light on the transmit links to another output port. What might be initially misleading is you end up with two output ports per optical tap because you're getting the transmit from both sides of the link. So this way, if you're tapping a 10 gigabit second link, you can potentially end up with 20 gigs a second worth of traffic to process and monitor. Don't forget about this in your capacity plans. And this effect isn't limited to optical taps. You'll see it with span sessions as well. However, that raises an important question of how do you get 20 gigs of traffic out of 10 gig port anyway? So we've seen from our scorecard, our generation 1.5 design didn't solve all our problems. The install effort is still high and actually gotten worse for generation 1.5. We've also only solved half our scaling problems by being able to add hosts. While we can scale with bandwidth, we're still spending significant time and effort in actually getting these hosts installed in the first place. We need to make sure we reduce down this time if we want to keep pace with the growth of the network. And what if we could reduce or eliminate all the cabling work or all the effort installed in, installed in, in installing individual servers in the first place? So our bro generation 2.0 design is how we're driving down this install effort. Now all our hosts, load balancers, and optical taps are arriving in pre-assembled racks. By doing this, we've eliminated most of the installed efforts straight away. This design is being rolled out as part of all new data center builds, and we're also retrofitting our generation 1.5 sites as well. We do, this for cons we do this for consistency reasons and operational sanity. There is nothing quite as irritating as hearing this data center is different. And these racks come in three sizes. Depending on the amount of bandwidth the firewall can process, we order a bro rack to match that number. This means we've also reduced the number of decisions which need to be made during a data center build as well. And this is how it all physically looks. The firewalls are now in one rack with our low balancer. We do this to avoid any issues with light loss due to our optical taps, while our bro rack contains all the bro hosts. We also have another additional benefit of this is no longer an intrusive install. We've decoupled ourselves from our firewall team's deployment schedule. We're now confident that all the firewalls are going to come in pre-installed with the correct hardware from day one. We've also eliminated the, data, the work that our data center staff have to do to install multiple individual servers. And the most effort that's involved at this point when these racks arrive up is we run a cable from our low balancer in the bro rack to a low balancer in the network rack. Simple. And what happens if we actually run out of capacity on a single bro rack? We just add another one. It is that simple. Our generation two design has, installed, has solved our install effort issue. Now we're green across all these metrics or decisions and continue to scale with the growth of the network without spending significant time or effort in doing so. You may ask why our cost per gigabit has remained green throughout this. Yes, it is true we've added more servers, but the amount of bandwidth we can process has increased at the same time. So our overall cost has remained the same. For capital expenditure, capital expenditure reasons, we do have three rack sizes small, medium, and large. 
clearly we have a very original naming scheme. There's no point buying a large rack if it's going to be connected to a small firewall. It's a waste of money at that point. So, great. We now have Bro running, generating all these logs. But unless someone's actually doing something with these logs, it's been a complete waste of effort. So as I mentioned before, we have a log tailing agent running on all our Bro hosts. Think anything like Flume, Logstash, any, something, any of those open source versions, which is streaming logs to our central log store. Some of our internal testing shows the time between a, an event being written in the Bro log to it arriving in our cluster is under 10 seconds. Speed is vital during this process. We can't afford to wait for some batch process to pick up this data and process it at some later point. However, streaming all this data isn't cheap either. We're playing a conservative right now and streaming all the data. It will be a decision we have to revisit in the end. But when it comes down to it, what do you care about more? The delivery speed of your intel.log or the delivery speed of the error log? I choose intel log. So our central log store looks like this. It's a clearly highly technical diagram. <laughs> so what it means is we process in, in, incoming multiple data feeds from separate applications. So we have our NetFlow collector being one app, application feed, Bro being another one. Authorized users can then basically query this data for whatever reason they need to. It goes back for a while as well. So now we have the central log store. We no longer actually have to use the Intel framework in Bro either. What we've done is we've moved all that logic and detect and matching logic to higher in the stream or higher in the stack. Some of the benefits we've actually gained for this is there's less state we now have to maintain on our bro hosts. More simplicity, a good win there. There's also less work for our bro hosts to do as well. So maybe we can squeeze more performance out of these boxes. And instead of having to find each data producer that has an Intel framework in it, this logic has now been shifted um, to our central log store. So we can use more applications and get the same benefits. Although I believe there is a path to fix this, and Seth will probably correct me at this point, it used to be a case of removing an element from the Intel framework used to require full bro restart. Obviously, that was an intrusive change. OK. I was waiting for if I was going to be corrected or told I was right. And, um, all right, cool. So in our first generation extract, transform, or load jobs, ETL, we'd assume that field one would always be the timestamp field. When the field ordering changed, this would have had a big impact on our downstream consumers. When we were testing Bro 2.4, we discovered the local response field had been introduced in the connection log. If we had allowed this to go out to production, that would have been a big mess. So what we've done is we've moved away from the tab separated value format into the JSON writer, so great one-line configuration change, and improved our ETL parsers that we can now add and reorder fields in our logs without having any impact on our downstream consumers. Renaming fields or dropping fields does still require a level of coordination. We have to realize we're only a small part of this overall pipeline. So we're close to wrapping up. What lessons did we actually learn from this deployment? Scale horizontally and not vertically. We spent far too much time focusing on individual hosts and trying to squeeze more performance. Throwing hardware at this, for us at least, was the right decision. We also got availability wins as well out of it. We no longer have a single point of failure. We will have to squeeze more performance out of our hosts, but that's a later problem for us. Stateless sensors. State is expensive in both maintaining it, keeping it up to date, and everything else you do with state. It also runs contrary to our goals of making grow simple. You've seen this in how we don't run clusters across physical machines. We've also moved our IOC matching elsewhere in the, uh, higher in the stack. And decoupled dependencies. Our taps now come pre-installed, so we no longer have to involve our networking team's firewall deployment efforts. We've also now moved to the log JSON format for our logs. We can add third-party scripts and other things where they're having to coordinate with all our downstream consumers. Obviously, unless we change something vital, and then we do have to coordinate them, but one problem at a time. So it gives us a level of flexibility, which we didn't have before. And now plan up front and lab testing. I'll cover both of these at the same time. Our generation one design grew organically. And we keep relearning that reworking this solution is quite expensive. If we discovered the span bug, maybe we'd have gone straight to optical taps. And if we'd gone straight to optical taps, 
Maybe we would have discovered all this cabling work is quite painful. We could have skipped our generation 1.5 design entirely. And get experts on site. Seth used to be able to spot errors in our logs. Hopefully that's not the case anymore. But Borala could pay us an annual visit. A fresh pair of eyes can never hurt. And document your wins. When your finance team comes knocking on your door going, why are you spending all this money? We have a single page we hand back to them and go, here's why. Conversation over. It's a great place to be in. <laughs> and knowing your customers. When we first showed our bro deployment to our vice president, he fell in love with the data it was generating. He's now tracking all our status updates all the time. While his, having his support is great, is this the level of visibility you want? Every time a date slipped, he was very aware of it and asking very pointed questions. You also have to make sure that you're in lines with, aligned with your internal customers as well. There's no point in me going out and deploying the solution and generating all this data if it's, they're never going to look at it. We don't want to be a fire hose of raw data. So we've really built on top of the shoulders of giants here. We're voracious readers, and many of you have actually likely contributed to our deployment in one way or another. And that's it for me. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them at least. Availability. Sorry, the question is why are we using passive taps and low bouncers? It's availability reasons. If the active, active, active tap fails, um, we're now involved in, we don't want to ever be in line in the network. That was the reason we chose passive taps. So the question is for people hosting stuff in the Amazon cloud, are we looping it back out again? Everything I've talked about is limited to our corporate network, which is still running on physical hardware. So the stuff in our corporate sites and offices and so on. So the question is basically, Amazon has you probably unique downtime notification requirements, and what do we do to minimize the impact, if I summarize correctly? We have the taps pre-installed. They don't get turned up without them in the first place. Worst case, if we do have to shift, we can shift traffic from one firewall to another. So it's a fairly seamless move, so we don't actually have any um, downtime for our corporate network. So the question is, what are the users doing with all the data? within that diagram. Within that diagram, that user is actually meant to represent the typical corporate user, someone who's on their laptop and checking mail or so on. Yes. So unfortunately, that's the bit I can't go into. All this data goes to our central log store. People do things with that data at that point, and that's about as much as I can say, unfortunately. <laughs> so the question is, could I share the excitement with Bro with the AWS team? Amazon basically has an account manager for all, the, all we do with AWS. I've communicated this to them, so. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, for everyone who is using AWS, make feature requests on the forums. If you have account managers, talk to them. The only reason, all our customer pro, our requests get prioritized. The more they hear about it, the higher up the list it goes. So the question is, does our proprietary log store, or does, do we use a proprietary log store, and how do we scale out? So yes, we do use a proprietary log streaming. Imagine, we're they going to much like Kafka or anything along those lines. Um, and then for scaling out, we just add more hosts. Well, we used to. In our generation two design, we just add more racks. So the question is, how do we come up with our rack sizing? It basically, it matches the firewalls that it's been paired with. So our firewalls also come with standard designs. So we've now scaled out the number of hosts in those racks to match the maximum capacity, plus a percentage for hardware failures or replacements. The idea being, we've never scaled up a firewall with this new rack design. It's fairly recent, so when it happens, we'll address it when we come to it. <laughs> when Amazon releases its customer, the question is when Amazon releases its custom scripts, do we plan on packaging it? If we do release scripts, we would use the package manager, yes. <laughs> I'm not promising that we ever will release scripts, but. OK, if that's everyone. Oh, sorry. What is that NetFlow? It's a piece of software. Oh, sorry, the question is, what's that NetFlow collector? It's a piece of software which collects and processes NetFlow. It's redundancy. Why are we not using it? It's basically, it's in a form of redundancy. If our low balancer happens to fail for whatever reason, or um, what, a multitude of reasons you can think of, we still have visibility from the firewall itself. We also get stuff like policy denies. 
stuff that Bro won't naturally see because it will just see it as a TCP reject. And I think we're done. All right, thank you.